because it should be up to the families whether they choose to vaccinate or not. Um, and I always turn up to these wonderful protests um, because I do all the sound gigs. So I've been associated with about four different groups for the last nearly two years. We've had a um, different opinion of what the government tried to put on everyone else in society. Um, we put them in power and it should be up to us to sort of make the choices. How's your daughter now? Oh, she's, she's fine. She made, a, she made a full recovery, which I'm very grateful for. But I didn't want to risk um, more damage um, in subsequent vaccination. So I said it wasn't worth it. Yeah. My name is Willow, and I'll be your MC this morning. In an increasingly apathetic society, it's truly inspiring to see so many people turn out today and ready to fight for our rights. You may not know, uh, we do have rallies and events across Australia today. So we have events happening in Sydney, Melbourne, Launceston, Canberra, Perth and Adelaide. So we wish them a great day today too. Yeah. Oops, sorry. We've come... Let's all pop it, okay. <laughs> We've come together today to show the government that we will not tolerate this erosion of human rights. We will not give up our right to choose medical procedures for our children and ourselves. And we will not be coerced or bribed through financial incentives or financial penalisation. We have a mixed crowd today. There are some of us who vaccinate. There are some of us who partially vaccinate. And there are some of us who don't vaccinate at all. However, our vaccination status and that of our children is irrelevant. We have come here today because we all believe in our right to determine appropriate health care for ourselves and our children. Yes. We have a lot of some great speakers. So how did we get here today? Most of us grew up in an era where vaccination was voluntary. Available, but totally voluntary. Our parents could choose whether to vaccinate us or not without fear of favour or fear. For smallpox, tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis and polio. The measles vaccine came along in 1969, rubella in the 70s and the combined measles, mumps and rubella vaccine in the 80s. This was all voluntary. And if you want to credit vaccines for controlling these diseases, you must then acknowledge that this is achieved by totally voluntary vaccination. In the 1980s, it is estimated that only 53% of children were adequately vaccinated. In 1994, the Howard government ran a pilot childhood vaccination register to track immunisation coverage, issue reminders and consolidate immunisation history. This was about 21 doses to 8 diseases by the time a child was 6 years old. In 1996, it was fully adopted. Not only was this vaccination program taxpayer funded, but an additional carrot was added by way of the maternity immunisation allowance. Approximately $250 reward paid in two instalments for meeting the government's immunisation requirements. The system changed from being a voluntary or opt-in system to being opt-out, and parents could opt out of the vaccination schedule by using the conscientious objection form. So if there was a medical, philosophical, religious or personal belief that your child should not adhere to the current version of the childhood vaccination schedule, this was your form. With this form, parents could object to the vaccination schedule, not necessarily all vaccines, but to the schedule, its timing and one or more of the vaccines. With this form, parents could still claim the maternity immunisation allowance. In July 2012, 
the government stopped the maternity immunisation allowance and tied vaccination status to family tax benefit A end of year supplement. This was just under $2,200 and paid in three instalments at the, uh, in the financial years that the child turned one, two and five. Children need to be fully immunised on a recognised immunisation catch-up schedule or have an approved exemption. The exemption either being the content subjection or medical exemption. With the increase in financial incentives, almost nine times more, it became worthwhile to have a conscientious objection form when not complying with the vaccine vaccination schedule. By 2012, the childhood vaccination schedule had increased from its 21 doses to eight diseases by age six, to 38 doses to 13 diseases by age four for the main schedule, and 41 doses to 14 diseases for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. The choice is still there to vaccinate or not, but this choice is leveraged by government support such that only those who don't need the family tax benefit supplement or childcare payments can afford to stand by their beliefs. Interestingly, with, in Mr Abbott's electorate, North Manly, one of the most affluent areas in the country, also has the lowest childhood vaccination rate at about 83 to 85 per cent. This policy is social discrimination because only the families who do not need STD, CCB and CCR can afford to stand by their convictions. It is racial discrimination. Yeah. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders require an extra dose of the pneumococcal vaccine and two doses of Hep A vax to meet vaccination requirements. To sweeten the deal for doctors, the Abbott government will pay doctors a six dollar incentive to chase up the parents of children who have fallen behind in their vaccination. This is all the while we have the highest vaccination rates in our history with a national average of 91%. So where does this leave our children's future? We have never achieved the magical 95% fully compliant to the vaccination schedule and probably never will because the definition of fully immunised will change as more vaccines are added to the schedule. The government is looking at vaccine uptake as a measure of public health, not the lack of disease. If disease notification rates are graphed against childhood vaccination rates, there is no correlation. If the vaccination schedule works, we should see a decrease in all the diseases as compliance with the schedule increases. Comments by Australia's Commonwealth Director of Health, J.H.L. Cumston and Australia's Nobel Laureate for Immunology, McFarlane Burnett, clearly stated that public health reforms such as sanitation, hygiene, nutrition and smaller family sizes from 1850 to 1950 were the most important factors in reducing the deaths and illness due to infectious diseases. Therefore, the government is incorrect to suggest that high petition rates in all vaccination programs are necessary to prevent deaths and illness from returning as a public health problem. A threat or perceived threat does not justify the erosion of civil liberties. Disease occurrence is reported to the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System. Plot this data against the percentage of fully vaccinated children, and we should, if what we are being told is correct, see disease occurrence decrease as the vaccination schedule compliance increases. We don't. Why are they being penalised for not being obedient to a schedule which is not working as they promised us? These statistics I've quoted today are no secret. They are freely available for anyone to read. They are taken from the Childhood Immunisation Handbook, humanservices.gov.au website, the national, uh, and the National Immunisation Strategy. I encourage you all to look into this and see for yourself. I've made a copy of the graph available on the table for anyone.
It is encouraging to see that there are still Australians who believe in the power and the importance of our constitution, who believe in the importance of honouring human rights and the individual's right to autonomy over their body. It is heartening to see that there are still Australians who believe in the ideals and ethics of freedom and democracy, ideologies that lately seem to be dying at alarming rates. You will find a table over here today containing letters of will that you can sign in protest of this legislation, if you haven't done so yet. We will be sending them in to the relevant ministers and MPs on your behalf. If you are listening to this via the internet at a later date and are not able to join us here today, you can visit the No Jab, No Pay, No Way website on Weebly as well as find the letters on our Will Be Done Restored Democracy Facebook page. The government cannot force any Australian to participate in any medical treatment or service by any means. People have argued that this is not what is meant by this section, but in the judge's summary in the High Court in 1949, in the case of the British Medical Association versus the Commonwealth, in which this section of the Constitution was examined as part of the case, the judges said that it did indeed represent the inability of the government to force the public or private sector into any form of medical service or treatment. Compulsion of medical services to any extent or of any nature, whether legal, by the imposition of penalties, practical, by any other means, direct or indirect, could not be authorised. Freedom and safety is completely ignoring its own laws. Yeah. It is even more unbelievable that they ignore the international governing rights of the individual to informed consent as stated in the UN's Universal Declaration of Bioethics and Human Rights. They are also ignoring the right to medical freedom and bodily integrity as noted in the International Human Rights Charter. It is clear that the government's proposed no jab, no pay legislation violates this basic tenet. Judy Wileman of Vaccination Decisions website writes, while the Australian government states vaccination in Australia is not compulsory, the government is using employment and financial incentives, which is coercion, to remove the free choice of Australians to use vaccines. There are requirements in place in some Australian workplaces that mandate recommended vaccines for individuals in order to be employed. This is removing our rights in a discriminatory manner and this is occurring in Australia even though the government states that vaccination is not compulsory. Judy Wileman of Vaccination Decisions has been working long and hard on a proposed piece of legislation which can help protect our of substances that were once deemed safe by science and our governments. Yet time proved that they were not. That they were in fact deadly and that the science that initially spoke to their safety was flawed, fueled primarily by the wheel of industry and the almighty dollar. Asbestos was once hailed as a wonder product and deemed totally safe, yet as early as the 1930s, medical science began to show the connection between asbestos and the deadly cancer we now know as mesothelioma. Nonetheless, asbestos remained in widespread use throughout the 20th century until eventually, after decades of a small percentage of people continually voicing their concerns, people started to listen. And the rising public anger at the asbestos industry for concealing the risks of asbestos eventually led to regulatory action. Unfortunately, asbestos history will show regulatory efforts to be a little too late for countless workers and consumers already exposed to asbestos. Everyone knows a little bit about the rise and fall of DDT, how it was once hailed as a great boon to mankind, how useful it was in the field and garden, house and yard, and how to at last, to our dismay, it was unmasked as a killer, the chemical threat to our environment and our health. For decades, objectives to the safety of DDT were ignored, yet once again, finally, the voices of that small percent of objectives were heard and governments around the world 
have begun to implement their phase-out policy. Once again, in a little, too little, too late move for many workers and consumers already exposed. Fluoride, GMOs and more. Isn't it time we listen to history? Isn't it time we stopped putting profit before portion? Isn't it time we learned from our past mistakes? I say it is. I say it's time we listen to history and those small, small percent of voices who are crying out the warnings and not to what those with a financially invested interest in the end product have to say. Because when your research team is connected to your bottom line, history proves we cannot trust you. Second baby syndrome is merely inflammation of the cerebral cortex, which is the brain. And it comes up against the skull and bruises. And it can injure or kill a baby. Sometimes they can die, they can get the injury on the first vaccine and then subsequent vaccines will boost them off. The police will because they're brainwashed, like, like I was, and the only reason I woke up is because I was injured by the vaccine, the hepatitis C vaccine. I was in bed for two weeks, and I could feel the life force in me being sucked out, and I was going down. And it was only because I got out of bed, and I went to a doctor, and I said to the doctor, could this be the vaccine that made me tired? And the doctor replied instantly, no, it wouldn't have been that. And then said next and shut me out of the office. They don't want to know about vaccines doing damage. And they'll get angry because they've been brainwashed to believe that vaccines are helping, but in fact, they are harming everyone that gets one. So we could compare it. And when I would go to that sudden death scene where a baby was deceased and we'd have the ambulance and so on and try and revive them. I would ask the mother, what was the baby's health like prior to the vaccine? And it was almost like a light coming on because they're brainwashed too. The baby was eating, sleeping, serene in their arms, growing normally, and it was only after the vaccine that all hell broke loose with convulsions and seizures and finally dying and then the, the police that don't realize this are going to that ha same house and they're accusing the, the mother or they believe the mother has done it and the police go to these scan meetings it's called suspected child abuse network the doctors and the police meet at these meetings to decide who they're going to prosecute next because the baby could go into the hospital with listless and no life force in them. The doctors and the medical people, because of their parent brainwashing, are thinking that you did it. They're thinking that you're the person that shook the baby or threw it on the bed repeatedly, which I've read in the newspapers as a reason for a baby getting the cerebral cortex swelling. Whether it's SIDS or SUDI or SBS, it is always cerebral cortex swelling where the brain literally expands inside the skull and causes the baby to either get brain damage or death. And Dr. Russell Claylock has proved that this is happening to these children that get vaccines. And the police are saying, because they're brainwashed, that the bruising is from the shaking. It's debunked. The shaken baby syndrome is being debunked in America, but it's still being used. And you know, if you get AIDS, an injured baby, and the police, they use the doctors who vaccinate to give evidence against you in court. 
have that. They kill your baby with a vaccine and then they get into the witness box and get evidence against you for shaking baby and you go to jail. That's what is happening and that is what is in jail right now. And I know this to be the case because I have 22 years of policing experience to watch it from very many angles. Yeah. He came back, he told me that he'd seen a very unusual case. And I said, tell me about it. And he said there was a baby died. And, and, I, and I said, well, what's so strange about that? And he said, well, there was actually this is the second one. This lady had suffered two babies dying in the, in the one family from vaccines. And I have offered to give him information and it was actually a video of doctors all saying that vaccines are killing children and, uh, and, and not the, the ones they don't kill they injure. And it was on his desk and, and he was going to look at it and a, few, a week later it was still on his desk. And I said, have you looked at the video yet? And he said, no, don't worry about it. Take, you better take it, take it away. I don't want to look at it. They know it is a death sentence on their career. And that's what happened to me. I was helping someone that was falsely accused by giving them information about how vaccines are causing that damage to the brain. And the next thing you know, the hierarchy are after me. They've been after me for 10 years before they finally got me because I had noticed that this was, all this was happening about the halfway mark of my career. And I, certainly, I should be still working for another 10 years, but unfortunately that's what they do to you when you when they find out that you're against their system of covering up vaccine crimes by blaming parents. 